it's Danielle Smith with the Alberta Enterprise Group. We're collaborating with Common Sense Calgary on interviews with candidates for the upcoming civic election in Calgary on October the 18th. And joining us now is your candidate for Ward 10, Abbott Harb. Abbott, thanks so much for being with me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan well, of your show. Oh, my pleasure. So let's 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 chat chat a little bit about why it is you decided to run for council at this time. What what makes you think you'd be a great council member? Sure. So the reason why I'm running for city council is because I'm extremely frustrated with how mm -hmm. Northeast has been neglected at city council, specifically the Ward 10 part. The city always seems to find money for downtown, for the mm -hmm. southwest, for the northwest. But whenever we're trying to do anything in Ward 10, the city says they have no money. I was born and raised in that area, living most of my life between Temple and Rundle community. And I know all we want is to be treated fairly. We don't want more than other areas, but right now we're getting less and that's not right. Give me an idea of some of the things that are missing from your community that you see elsewhere. So they're, they're, every neighborhood has its own set of uh, issues. Um, if you start on the West End in Malin Heights, there is a train station there, the Max Bell train station. I born and raised in Northeast Calgary. I didn't even know there was a parking lot on the north side. Hmm. It's on a piece of private land. It's a gravel road. Uh, any other part of the city, they would have found some sort of solution there. But because it's east of Deerfoot, I feel like there's this acceptance that while it's east of Deerfoot, it's okay. We mm. can, they can live with it. Um, in the other parts of the ward and more of the northeast side and the properties, Temple, Whitehorn, Pine Ridge, Rundle, we have these beautiful green spaces that are just completely vacant. There's schools on either side and this really large green space in the middle. I'd like to see mm. at least a bench in there, a gazebo, some sort of uh, something in there to attract the community members, mm. the neighbors. You know, it's the people of Northeast Calgary that need these types of services more than anyone else. We don't, many of us don't have the luxury of flying to Hawaii for Christmas holidays or going to Banff and Lake Louise. So there, even our sidewalks, when our sidewalk repairs, you know, a lot. I've been doing a lot of door knocking and I can't tell you how many times I've literally tripped mm. because of how uneven the sidewalk is. You know, the roots mm. are growing through the sidewalks and they do these patch overs. And, you know, there are a lot of things that when it comes to the Northeast, we don't get our fair share. Thank you for going through all of that. Are there any other sort of uh, ward-wide, it sounds like you've got a lot of specific issues in specific communities, any ward-wide issues that you're hearing about when you go door-to-door? -door? I think the three top ones that come up is public safety, first of all. There, there yeah. is a lot of crime and unfortunate issues that happen in that part of the city. Um, another thing is, you know, jobs. We are all suffering, uh, first because of the 2014 crash in the oil prices. But more recently, because of COVID, you know, people are really suffering. Some people are struggling to make ends meet. And third, just that more investment in that area. We are mm -hmm. at a critical point in our infrastructure's life cycle, where if the city doesn't start reinvesting in those core neighborhoods that make up Ward 10, they're going to start to look really degraded. And when that happens, property value goes down and a lot of bad things come in. I oh. genuinely, in the bottom of my heart, believe we can still turn it around. We just need someone who's going to fight for us at City Hall. All right. So talk to me a bit then about some of the work that you've done in the past so that I know how it connects to, to what the, the kind of role that you would have on council. Sure. So I'm currently on leave from my role as a senior policy advisor in the agriculture department. Oh. Uh, before that, I worked in the energy sector at a major pipeline company focusing on mergers and acquisitions, business development and market access. Before that, I worked at the Canada Revenue Agency for, for a few years. So I understand how the government works and how the private sector works. Okay, let's uh, go through a little bit then about how city council works in particular. So when you when you look at uh, the relationship between the council members and administration, do, do you think it's it's functioning as it should or do you think that there needs to be some, some changes? It does seem to me just from an outside perspective that there's a lot of initiatives that come from city hall and in some cases the council acts as a bit of a rubber stamp but, you know, as a governance board, maybe that's appropriate. What do you think? So that's a really good point. I think, uh, first of all, this is an exciting election for Calgarians. This is the first time, at least in my lifetime, and I think in modern history, that we have at least 10 new city councillors and a brand new mayor. So this gives this new elected council, and if, if the good people of Ward 10 elect me, I'll have the pleasure of serving and really ensuring that the priorities of 
City Hall align with the priorities of the residents of mm -hmm. War 10 specifically, but also Calgary as a whole. I think what may have been true 10, 15, 20 years ago may not be true anymore. So it's an exciting opportunity to make sure that alignment is there. Also with regards to uh, the divisiveness of city council, I think it's really unfortunate because at the end of the day, it's us as Calgarians that suffer. Mm -hmm. We are at a critical point in our history, in Calgary's history. We need to do a better, and, and like I said, I worked in the energy sector. I know how important the energy sector is for Calgary's economy, but we must do a better job in diversifying our economy, attracting the economic growth of the future. And we need a city council that's willing to work together with all levels of government, because we need all three levels of government working hand in glove to address the challenges that we're facing right now. All right. There'll be a few specific issues I'll ask you on that in a, in a minute. But from a high level point of view, one of the things you have to do is uh, manage the budget, determine the level of, and approve the level of spending and the level of taxes. So let me begin first on this on the uh, spending side. When you look at the level of spending, do you think it's too much, too little or do you think it's about right? Well, I think our spending is a reflection of our past. And while mm -hmm. Calgary was booming and growing, there are a lot of things that were justified now we have the big challenge the property value of our towers in downtown has diminished significantly and as a result that burden has been spread across to other parts of the city what i'm focused on if i get elected is ensuring that we increase our tax base hmm. not our tax rate but our tax base attracting the economies of the future calgary economic development issued a report not too long ago where it talked about the seven core industries that will be uh, the growth sector for Calgary in the short term and medium term. Of those seven, three of them are industries where Calgary has a competitive advantage in. The first one is energy. As the world moves away from fossil fuel and into more clean, green, renewable energy, Calgary can still be a global leader in that space. We have the subject matter expertise. We have the talent. We have the resources. We also have some great companies doing some great work in that space, some really big energy companies that are recognizing the future of energy. So we can still be a global leader in that space. The second one is transportation and logistics. We're uniquely positioned to have really quick access in Calgary to the West Coast, the California markets, the East, uh, Eastern Canada, and also the Eastern Seaboard in the U.S. So we could be an inland hub where we can start attracting these transportation and logistics companies to come here. And the third one is agri-food and agribusiness. The world's population is going to grow by a billion over the next 15 to 20 years. And Canada has a strong brand, strong name recognition around the world. But what we're lacking is more value added. So we have an opportunity to do more of that value added here in Calgary, which is going to bring jobs for us Calgarians. Great identification of the three top issues and top sectors. Now, the question I'd have is there's lots of different approaches you can take on business attraction. And so you can reduce taxes, you can give tax holidays, you can reduce regulation and red tape, make it easier to get permits. You could do what Calgary Economic Development Authority has done. They had a $100 million fund to use for direct business attraction. What kind of approaches do you favor? So I actually like to be able to use all the tools in the toolbox. All of those ideas are, are things that we need to do. First of all, with cutting the red tape, there are people, there are investors that are looking at doing building projects here in Calgary. But because of the delay and how long it takes to get approval, they actually literally, I, I know a story of someone who wanted to build something in Calgary, I think a 30-story building. Calgary was going to take six to eight months to get back to him. He decided to go to Edmonton, who was able to fast track it in a few weeks. So, so that's one. Two, the tax holidays. We have empty lots right now where if we can give an incentive to someone and say, and it's all on a case-by-case -case basis. I want to be really clear. We have to study each proposal for its merits. But there are exciting opportunities with tax holidays where there are pieces of land that are empty, which might need a little nudge. The city is collecting the property tax on an empty lot either way. So if it gives a five-year holiday, for example, then in year six, it starts collecting that revenue. And if we would have done a little bit of that five years ago, we could have some of that revenue already in the coffers. Okay, great, great thoughts on that. So 
I want to talk, I want to go over and talk a little bit more about taxes. So I understand your direction on how you would, I understand your focus would be on bringing in new revenue by attracting new businesses, but you identified this tax shift problem that the downtown has been hollowed out. And so those tax revenues got spread into the businesses in the outlying community. When that got to be too heavy, it got split into or, or shared with the residential tax base. What do you think needs to happen on the tax front? Well, I think right now people are suffering. Uh, we, we can only increase the taxes so much. Mm -hmm. Businesses are suffering. They've seen exponential growth in their tax rate. We need to make sure that we address the reality of the current economic environment that we're in and not act as if this is still 2013. We are living in tough times right now, and I think everyone needs to be willing to tighten their belt and make sure that we work together. I am confident that Calgary's best years are ahead of us. We are lucky. We live in one of the, we live in the best city, in the best province, in the best country in the world. Our future will be better than our past. We just need all three levels of government working together to make this pivot of Calgary and Edmonton, all of Alberta, a priority to ensure that we have a healthy transition. All oh, right, and sometimes uh, because of the limitation in being able to raise money through either transfers from government or through property taxes, you hear proposals for new taxation powers for the cities, particularly Edmonton and Calgary in the context of city charters. Would you favor new tax revenues or new tax sources? No, I would not. I would not favor new tax revenues. I think what we need to do, like I said earlier, if we have, uh, if I'm elected onto council, there will be at least 10 new city councillors, a new mayor. We can work to ensure that the priorities of what the city is focusing on are aligning with what Calgarians want and finding space where we could maybe, you know, invest more in other areas and less in what maybe some projects that the city is doing that don't align with the hmm. priorities of Calgarians. All right. So we'll talk about the budget now in two pieces. So first on the operating side, when you look at the uh, where the, the city spends most of its money. It's on salaries, wages, benefits, um, pensions. So we'll deal with it sort of in three layers, uh, the frontline management layer, and then council. So th there have been uh, proposals in the past to reduce council pay, council transition allowances, uh, change the pension to define contribution. Do you, th do you think anything needs to be changed with council compensation? So I, currently, City Council has voted to freeze count, uh, councillor salaries until the end of this year. If I get elected onto council, I, I would support continuing that freeze. Um, I think it's important that in this tough economic time that council leads by example. Okay, let's then talk about management layers and management compensation. What kind of approach would you take there? So what I... The approach that I would like to take is ensuring that there's accountability. Now, we, we need to be careful. We need to attract the best and brightest from across Calgary and Canada to come work for the city. So we need to be really careful not to be penny wise and pound foolish, where we start cutting salaries of certain people and therefore not mm. getting the top qualified people. But at the same time, we need accountability. We need KPIs, key performance indicators, where people are held, uh, city managers, uh, city senior city officials are held accountable for their depart departments, making sure that they deliver. I'm hoping to get at some inside looks since you've worked in government administration before. What are the kinds of things that tend to go wrong? I mean, because we look at it from the outside and it's a big black box, and but we know that things aren't working efficiently. Is it because there's too many layers of managers? Is it because we've got the wrong people in management positions? They're too connected from the front line? Is it because frontline ideas don't find their way up to managers. What's your observation from having seen administrations work from the inside? So I work more on the policy development side. Um, so I, I can't speak to too much of the bureaucracy okay. itself. But I, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's just people's priorities shift with time and making sure that the government is prioritizing what the citizens want, what the constituents want. That is what's going to be key for continued success and, okay. and making sure people are held accountable. So then let's talk about the front line, because um, one of the things that happens when you're doing collective bargaining agreements is often they're multi-year. There's also sort of steps in the ladder that as you gain seniority, there's also automatic pay increases. But what can happen is that because those are set, they can sometimes be offside with what's happening in the general market. And I think we've seen in the private sector, there's been wage rollbacks, there has been austerity, there's been job sharing, there has, has been um, layoffs. Do you think that there is a, a need to, to right size the, the size of the, of the front line as well or approach collective bargaining in a different way? I think for 
everything is a case by case basis. So we need to really take a look underneath the hood. In my mind, one of the priorities is making sure that it's not a race to the bottom. We need to be careful in making sure that we make the right decision. Sometimes certain decisions seem like they might be profitable for the city in the short run without taking into consideration some of the long-term implications. There are a lot of um, issues that need to be addressed, especially in light of the current economic situation. And I think all options need to be on the table. Um, and as someone who has a background in mergers and acquisitions and in negotiations, sitting down with the relevant uh, stakeholders, the subject matter experts, to work together on a solution that is in Calgary's best interest would be my priority. All right. So you talked about a lot of, um of spending taking place downtown. And so I want to talk to you about a couple of, of projects that have been approved and just get your your take on um, on how you feel about them. Because th there is only one capital budget. And when you have a lot of money going to certain projects, it means that there's less for other projects that might come forward. So let's begin with the, the big one, which is the Green Line LRT. So it began as a $4.7 billion project for the full line that would go deep south, deep north, and be funded by three parties. It's not the same project that it started out as. It's now over $5 billion. It's only going to be 20 kilometers. It doesn't go nearly as far in either direction that, uh, that it was originally originally intended. So when you look at a project like that, is uh, would you say it should be scrapped altogether and go back to the drawing board? Is there a way to fix it that you have uh, have come across? Or is it just full steam ahead the way it's been it's been planned out? What do you think? So one of my biggest fears is paralysis by analysis. So over analyzing things and make and making it take longer than it should. I am a supporter of public transit. I think public transit is key. We have five great train stations in Ward 10. Um, they need, some of them need some revitalization. Mm. Um, I support the Green Line because I think public transit is important. We need reliable, accessible, and more affordable public transit. That's what I stand in support of. There are issues with the Green Line that I think uh, need to be addressed. I feel like some of the more contentious issues have been left for future council to, to address. Um, but I am in support of public transit, uh, and I do support the Green Line. Unfortunately, it is taking a little bit longer to get to the, the starting point, which is causing the cost to increase. Um, we need to make sure that things are on budget, and we need to make, like I said before, people accountable for uh, to make sure that it is on budget. Okay, let me ask you about the other uh, four big projects. When they first came over the, the, uh, for approval, the city voted to approve them against the advice of the city's CFO who said that they could only afford one of them. So if you'd been on council, I want to know what would have been at the top of your priority list. So uh, the event center with the Calgary Flames, the BMO Center expansion for new um, convention space, the Arts Commons transformation, or the Foothills Fieldhouse. What do you think is the priority? I want to start off by saying I'm a big fan of the Calgary Flames. I was born and raised in Calgary. I remember when my uncle took me after the Flames won the Cup uh, back in 1988-89 uh, to Olympic Plaza. I, I, I was involved in the Red Mile. I had the pleasure of spending a lot of time on the Red Mile during the last Flames uh, run to the playoffs. Uh, but I'm not a fan of giving millions to billionaires. Uh, we tend to compare our Calgary Arena deal to the Edmonton Arena deal. I'd rather compare our, our Calgary Arena deal to other arena deals in North America. And while it's easy to be, uh, you know, a Monday morning quarterback and to say, you know, it could have been a better deal. I, I really think we could have, uh, as Calgarians, received a better deal. Um, it's unfortunate. It is what it is. Um, and now, most recently, we've seen the cost escalate, and now they're coming back to the city asking for even more funds. The Calgary Flames is a very lucrative hockey business. I don't think they would have left Calgary, and even if they would have, another uh, team would have came in really quickly, I, I believe. But I don't believe they would have left. So I'm not a big fan of the uh, arena deal. Um, when it comes to the BMO expansion, I think that's the type of transformative infrastructure investment that we need. It's those types of facilities that actually help us attract those economies of the future. We need to recognize that the future of Calgary is going to be a lot more challenging than our past. We need to work that much harder to attract those economic drivers of the future. Having that convention center, having a world-class convention center helps us in that space. Um, you know, if someone, if I was an international investor, looking at where to invest money or a multinational corporation. Calgary is a great city. It's a beautiful city. We all know that. We have 
beautiful um, amenities. We have the mountains. Mm -hmm. We have great infrastructure. We have the roads, uh, affordable uh, cost of living. Everything is there to attract those economies of the future. Even, unfortunately, our downtown has a 33% vacancy rate, but that is a sales pitch to someone saying, you could have a, your office ready to go within days, let alone weeks. So, so I support the uh, expansion. Um, the uh, arts commons i think you know the building itself is well past its best before date and so i support that project as well that's another one of those transformative infrastructure projects that help us attract people into the downtown core um the uh the foothills arena the uh, sports facility I, I think you know i think that one we may need to adjust our spend profile hmm. like you said the city may not be able to handle all four of those at once so it would be nice if we if we could adjust our spend profile on that project. Okay, let me talk to you about another aspect of attracting new revenues, and that's on the residential housing side. So first of all, there there was some controversy when the guidebook for great communities was being debated. Have you heard about that as you've gone door to door? Has that been an issue in in your ward? I have. I have heard about it. And, and what are people know, concerned about? So I, I think there's two things to it. One, it really demonstrates how divisive the city council was, unfortunately, where you had councillors saying that it is statutory and others saying that it's not statutory. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, residents were very confused. Um, there are opportunities for growth in War 10, but I think the consultation needs to be done in more of a sincere way. Sometimes I feel like the mm -hmm. consultation that the city holds is more to check a box as opposed to actually engage with the with the stakeholders and especially opposing stakeholders sometimes if they want something to go through they intentionally or unintentionally invite a certain group of people to make it seem like this is moving in the right direction when in reality you know there are people that are concerned specifically um there are development opportunities but you have to take into consideration its impact on the neighborhood you can't turn a single unit uh, a single family home into a fourplex especially when in front of that home is only one or two parking spots like these are the types of things that need to be addressed before certain projects are approved so talk to me about the balance because so oftentimes the debate over development comes down to the need to the, the desire to densify some of those less dense communities that are built further in that have the infrastructure versus the greenfield development for those who want new single family homes the communities are more dense but there's less infrastructure so how do you balance that debate so I, I think, you know, as everyone knows, the further you get out from the downtown core, the more expensive it is to develop, the more expensive, sorry, not to develop, but more expensive it is for the city to offer its services. So we need to be cognizant of that. Calgary has grown, you know, north and south. We do have some exciting opportunities in East Calgary, close to War 10, um, just to the east. But I think it's important that we um, try to build up where we can we have a lot of opportunity in downtown, even when the barrel was over $130. Downtown Calgary on a weekday night was still empty. So we still have some opportunities in downtown to grow up, to grow upwards, but also to be cognizant of some other opportunities that are on maybe the east side of the city. Okay. When I say affordable housing, what does that mean to you? Well, what affordable housing doesn't mean is a $400,000 townhouse in downtown Calgary. <laughs> uh, we have seniors, you know, when I talk about Ward 10, you know, we in Ward 10 didn't mind using our tax dollars to help Calgary grow, but now it's our turn to get our fair share. When I say that, the real people that helped Calgary grow are our seniors. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of seniors out there that are really struggling. They're living on fixed incomes and they need the support. They need real affordable housing. So that's something that, that I support. We do have an affordable housing shortage and affordable housing isn't a $400,000 unit in downtown Calgary. But what we also need to make sure is that the affordable housing units are dispersed around the city. Our solution to affordable housing cannot be to build 15 20 000 units in war 10 or east mm. of deerfoot we need to distribute those uh that development across the entire city okay one last aspect of affordability and you're right there's sort of two parts to it the other one is on the issue of homelessness do you have some thoughts on what needs to be done about that yeah it's really unfortunate um you know the homelessness crisis in calgary is is starting to get really bad we're starting to see it in war 10 there's people mm. literally living in porta potties and in you know back alleys and it's really unfortunate. Um, mm -hmm. I think 
it goes to show how when we don't address some of these affordable housing issues, the broader impact it has on society. But let me be clear, it's not the city's responsibility alone to address this. We need to work with all three levels of government to make sure that Calgary gets this attention right now, because like I said, we are at a critical point in our history. Okay, I have a number of issues that came up over the course of the last year that I would want to run by you just to make sure that we get your your thoughts on it. Let me begin with the issue of the defund the police movement, which is what they called themselves. What what do you think that means? Uh, and what do you think we should learn from the movement? Sure. I want to tell you a story. Uh, my brother-in-law was purchasing uh, a cell phone. Uh, he found someone on Kijiji and he met up with that individual on McLeod Trail. He thought he was in a well-lit area. It was a little bit later at night, but it was a well-lit area. There was a camera. He thought he was safe. As he, as he was negotiating with the individual, the individual's friends came up, creeped up behind him, oh, pulled no. out a gun on him, robbed him, ran to his vehicle where my mother, my sister, and my nephew were in, my one-year-old nephew. They literally put the gun to my mother's sister and my nephew's head and continued to rob, you know, the, the rest of the family. So, unfortunately, crime is here. Unfortunately, in War 10, crime is a problem. We need to be careful with this defund movement because we need the police to do what they're good at. At the same time, the police are doing things that, in my opinion, and maybe even they would agree, they're not subject matter experts in. For mm -hmm. example, there is a pilot project in the U.S. Uh, based on this program called the CAHOOTS program. What that CAHOOTS program is, is when someone calls 911, you have the option of police, fire, ambulance, and the mental health profession. Mm -hmm. What they realized was 20% of the calls coming into 911 were people experiencing mental health crises. Now, if someone is experiencing a mental health crisis, the last thing he or she wants is three or four armed police officers standing in his or her house with their boots on who are not trained to uh, be mental health professionals. So in this CAHOOTS program, what they do is they actually send subject matter experts, mental health professionals, to deal with the situation. And if needed, they could you know, quickly call for police backup if they needed. And what they realized was over 90%, over 95% of the calls did not require actual police presence. So there's things that the police are really good at. And there's things that other levels of government have offloaded onto the police where they're not good at. Another thing also is youth development. Uh, the police, the Edmonton police specifically received funding for at-risk, high-risk youth for youth mm -hmm. development. In my opinion, they shouldn't be the ones that are offering those types of programs. There are community-based, faith-based, uh, neighborhood-based associations that already have those contacts with those, with those individuals who could actually host a more efficient, a more cost-effective and better event than having the police offer it. So there are things that the police are good at. We need to make sure that they continue uh, in what they're good at, and we actually should fund them more on cultural sensitivity training uh, and things of that nature, but making sure that they're not distracted doing things that they're not subject matter experts in. All right, great answer. Where, where is that CAHOOTS program? What state would, is that in? Or is it just in? It's in Oregon, and then Oregon. Dallas did a pilot project that they're trying. Toronto introduced something like that as well, that they're trying. Even Calgary introduced a little bit something similar, but it's not at the same level of funding. So it's an exciting program that I think uh, we should consider in Calgary. Great, great, great option. Let's uh, talk about another aspect of policing. The city voted to reduce the speed limits to 40 kilometers per hour in the res out 40, 40 kilometers per hour in the residential communities. Did you support that move? Well, I, I think the important thing that especially in War 10 and probably across the city, but especially in War 10, in all the main arteries in all the neighborhoods in War 10, we have a problem with mostly younger people speeding, excessive street racing is a very big problem for mm -hmm. us and it doesn't matter what you make the speed limit if the police aren't there enforcing it then we have a problem um i have been door knocking even while i was door knocking just this week there was literally two cars that were racing down the street in whitehorn and there was a police officer there and he literally almost got hit by these two speeding cars so we have a problem of people excessive speeding driving up and down the main arteries 
Uh, neighbors have, while door knocking, people have asked me, have begged me to introduce speed bumps, to introduce more traffic cameras or more police presence. If I get elected, one of the first things I want to do, sit down with each, with each community, have a public consultation, reach out to them directly and see what they want as the community. Reducing the speed limit to 40 kilometers when the 50 kilometer wasn't being enforced in the first place uh, isn't helpful. Okay, let me ask you about uh, privatization uh, and the private delivery of public services. It's been talked about in the context of garbage collection, in, in the context of operating golf courses, or even in snow removal. What's what's your general approach to that? Do you favor it? So I think there are some services that could be done um, through a, a hybrid approach, especially some, we, we have some really big issues with snow removal, especially in some of the cul-de-sacs of the communities where the city doesn't do it. We need to find solutions where it's a hybrid approach, where we work together, but we need to be careful, like I said before, not to have a race to the bottom. There are services that the city provides that the city must continue to provide. Obviously, because of their GNA cost, because of their administration cost, it may cost a little bit more, but if it costs too much more, we need to really sit down and talk about why it's costing this much and what other options could be considered. Okay, let me ask you about a program that caused a little bit of controversy, the public art program. The, the ones that always come to mind are the Big Blue Ring in the north and the Beaufort Towers over in the west. Do you think they've fixed that program? Are you satisfied with it? Or would you take a different approach to public art? Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what the Calgary Arts Development Group does. They have a three-year, uh, I think it's $5.2 million to... Um, to determine what that art looks like. Um, art doesn't necessarily have to cost money. And right now, when Calgary is experiencing economic hardship, we need to really make sure that our money is being spent in the right places. Across the city, but especially in War 10, we have families that are struggling, that are living paycheck to paycheck, that are barely making ends meet. And before we start talking about art, we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to get these families back to work, to get them contributing back uh, to the tax coffers and making sure that they're working. That is a priority. Um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what Calgary Art Development does. There's a three year, they've been offered a three year term with the option of extending over 10 years. I'm not a big fan of giving them the extension for 10 years. I think we need to make sure each three years what they're doing, mm. making sure it aligns with what Calgarians want. All right. Okay. Just a couple more questions about the role of the elected council member, because there'll be a few referenda in the fall, one on equalization, one on daylight savings, one on fluoride. Generally speaking, what I want to ask you, though, is do you think that the residents should be able to directly vote on more issues? Or do you think that as an elected representative, it's your job to make those decisions yourself? I'm a big supporter of, of public consultations, engaging with communities. I think that's something that we need to do a better job at, uh, especially as elected officials and especially in Ward 10. Uh, engaging with the community, making sure that as an elected official, if the good people of Ward 10 elect me, I have a good sense of what people are concerned with, what's going on in their minds. At the end of the day, in my opinion, at a really high level, we elect our officials to make some of these tough decisions. They are the ones that will meet with the subject matter experts, with the stakeholders, have access to perfect information and make an informed decision. While I say that though, there are certain issues. The one that comes to mind is the Olympic bid. There are certain issues that maybe you do need to go to the public and have some sort of, you know, a referendum or a plebiscite to engage with uh, the residents. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we elect our, our officials to make some of those tough decisions. In extenuating circumstances, there are issues that need to come up for a referendum or a plebiscite, but uh, I don't think we should regularly be using that uh, tool in the toolbox. Okay, last question then, because sometimes you will find that there will be recommendations from city administration, they say are best for the city as a whole, but your uh, constituents will want you to vote a different way. What would you do there? Uh, at the end of the day, I want to be Ward 10's voice in City Hall. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be City Hall's voice in Ward 10. Uh, if I meet with the, the stakeholders and I have a good sense of what the issue is, I will take that to the constituents, share my thoughts. But if they're against a proposal and if they're against something, my role is to be Ward 10's voice in City Hall. All right. Well, thank you so much for the conversation today. I sure appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. That is your candidate for Ward 10, Abid Harb.